Hey, welcome back everyone to theCUBE's headquarters in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, the host of theCUBE, founder of SiliconANGLE Media. We're here for a CUBE conversation with Ryan Wells, who's the founder and CEO of Kindy. It's a hot startup, it's a growing startup, uh, doing really well in a hot area. It's in AI, it's where you know, cloud computing, AI, data all intersect around IoT. Um, RPA has been a hot trend, everyone's on there in that as well but really an interesting startup we want to profile here. Ryan, thanks for spending the time to come in and talk about the startup. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I love getting the startups in because we get the, we get the, we get the real scoop, you know, what's real, what's not real, and also practitioners also tell us the truth too, so yeah. <laughs> we'd love to have, especially founders in. So first, before we get started, talk about the company, how old is your company, what's the core value proposition, what do you guys do? Yeah, we're four years old. We were founded in June 2014. The, the first two, three years were really fundamental research and develop, developing some new AI algorithms. Um, what we focus on is we focused on building explainable AI products for government customers, um, pharmaceutical customers, and financial services customers. Um, What's so our, explainable our, AI? What yeah. does that mean? Like, are you explain that. I have people, AI works, it's basically machine learning. Well, AI doesn't really exist because it's really machine learning, and what is AI? So what is explainable AI? Yeah, for, for us, it's the ability of a machine to communicate with the user in natural language. So there's kind of two aspects to ex explainability. Some of the deep learning folks are grabbing onto it. And really what they're talking about with explainability is algorithmic transparency, where they tell you how the algorithm works, they tell you the parameters that are being used. Um, so I explained to you the algorithm, you can't actually in, uh, interrogate the system. For us, if our system's going to make a recommendation to you, mm -hmm. you would want to know why it's making the recommendation, right? So for us, we're able to communicate with users in natural language, like it's another person, mm -hmm. of why we make a recommendation, why we bring back a search result, why we do whatever it is as part of the business process. And uh, you mentioned deep learning, AI is obviously the buzzword everyone's talking about. I mean, I'm a big fan of AI in the sense that hyping it up means my kids know what it is. And yep. They don't really say, hey, yeah, I love machine learning. They, they love AI because it's got a futuristic sound to it. But deep learning is real. Deep learning is about learning systems that learn, mm -hmm. which means they need to know what's going on, right? So this learning loop, how does that work? Is that kind of where explainable AI needs to go? Is that where it's going, where if you can explain it and it's explainable, you can interrogate it? Does it have a learning mechanism to it? Well, there's, I think there's two major aspects of uh, intelligence. There's the learning aspect, and then there's the reasoning aspect. So if you look back through the history of AI, um, current machine learning is phenomenal at learning from data, like you're saying, learning the patterns in the data, but its reasoning is actually pretty weak. Um, it can do statistical inferencing, but in the field of symbolic AI, where there's inductive, deductive, abductive, analogical reasoning, kind of advanced reasoning, it's terrible at reasoning. Whereas the symbolic approaches are phenomenal at reasoning, but can't learn from data. So, you know, what is AI? Um, a subgroup of that is machine learning that can learn from data. Another subgroup of that, it's knowledge-based approaches, which can't learn from data, they're phenomenal at reasoning. And really the trend that we're seeing at the edge uh, in, in AI, or kind of the, the uh, cutting edge, is actually fusing those two paradigms together, which is effectively what we've done. You've seen uh, DeepMind and Google Brain publish a paper on that earlier this year. You've seen Gary Marcus start to talk about that. So, mm -hmm. so for us, explainability is kind of bringing together these two yeah. paradigms of AI. Where they can both learn from data, reason about data, and answer questions like, why are you giving me this recommendation? Great explanation, and I want to just ask you, what's the impact of that? Because it, you know, we've always talked in the old search world, meta reasoning, you type in a uh, misspelling on Google, yeah. and, and, it, and it says, oh, there's the misspelling. Okay, I get that, but what if I misspell the world, word all the time? Can't Google figure out that I really want that word? So reasoning has been a hard nut to crack. Yeah, Big well, time. Well, well, you have to acquire the knowledge first to combine bits of knowledge to then reason. Right, but the challenge is acquiring the knowledge. So you have all these uh, systems or knowledge-based approaches, and you have human beings on-site, professional services, building and managing your knowledge base. So that's been one of the hurdles for knowledge-based mm -hmm. approaches. Um, now you have machine learning that can learn from data. But one of the problems with that is that you need a bunch of labeled data. So it's, it's, you're kind of trading off between handcrafted knowledge systems, mm -hmm. Uh, handcrafted labeled systems, which can then learn from, from data. So the, the benefits of fusing the two together is you can use machine learning approaches to acquire the knowledge as opposed to hand engineering it. And then you can put that in a form um, or a data model that you can then reason about. So the benefits is, is really all comes out of the customer. Awesome, great, great air, great conversation. We can go for an hour on this. I love this topic. I think it's super relevant, as, as, especially as cloud and automation become the, the key accelerant to a lot of new value. Uh, but let's get back to the company. So, 
Four years old, yeah. did some R&D. Give us some, give them the stats. Where are you guys on the product side? Product shipping, what's the value proposition? How do people engage with you? Just go down the, yeah. go down the list. Yeah, uh, shipping product to customers in pharmaceutical um, and government use cases. Um, uh, how people engage Is with us. Is it a software product? It's a software product, okay. yeah, yeah. So we can deliver it. Um, surprisingly, a lot of customers still want it on-prem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but we can deploy in the cloud as, as, as well. Um, typically, um, how we work with customers is we'll have close engagements for uh, specific use cases within uh, pharma or government or financial services because it's a very broad platform and can be applied to any text-based use case. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with them closely, um, develop a use case, they're able to sell that internally to um, champions. And what problems are they solving? What specifically yeah. is the answer? So, 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 uh, uh, for pharmaceutical companies. Um, a lot of their internal historical clinical trial data, um, they'll develop uh, memos, emails, notes as they bring a drug to market. How do you leverage that data now instead of just you know, storing it? Yeah. How do I find new and innovative ways to use existing drugs that someone in another part of the organization could have developed? Um, how do I uh, manage the risks within that historical clinical trial data? Are there people that are doing research incorrectly? Are they reporting things incorrectly? You know, this entire process of both getting drugs through the pri pipeline and managing drugs as they move through, through the pipeline is a very manual process that revolves around text-based data sources. So how do you develop systems that amplify the productivity of the people that are developing the drugs, mm -hmm. and then also the people that are managing the process. And so what are you guys actually delivering as, as value? What's the value proposition for them? Time? Yeah, so, so, for, time? so uh, it's, it's saving time, but ultimately increasing their productivity of, of getting that work done. You know, it's, it's not replacing individuals. Um, so all, the, so all the, 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 the loose stuff like the paper, they can discover it faster, so they have more access to the data. That's right. Using that's right. your tools that's, and your, that's so, right. your software. You, you can classify things in okay. certain ways, saying there's data integrity issues, you need to look at this closer, um, but ultimately managing that data. And that's where machine learning and some of these AI techniques matter because you want to essentially throw the software at that problem, accelerate that process of gap of getting the data, bringing it in, assessing it. Yeah, I mean, we spend most of our time looking for the information to then analyze. Mm. I mean, we spend 80% of our time doing it, right? Where it's like, are there ways to automate that process mm -hmm. so we could spend 80% of our time actually doing our job? So Ryan, who's, <laughs> who's the customer out there? So is it, is it someone, someone's watching this video and what's their pain point? When do they call you? Why do they call you? <laughs> what's, you know, what's, what's some of the signals that might tell someone, hey, I want to give these guys a call, I need, I need the solution. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to the amount of manual labor that, that you're doing. So we see a lot of like big expenses around people. Mm -hmm. Um, because you haven't traditionally been able to uh, automate that process or to use software in that process. So if you actually look at your income statement and you say, where am I spending my most money on tons of people and you're just throwing people at the problem, that's typically where, where people engage with us and say, how do I amplify the productivity of, uh, of these people so I yeah. can get more out of them and yeah. ultimately make it's them It's not just efficient. so much to reduce the headcount issue, it's more of, Increasing the automation for say value in top line revenue because if you have to reproduce people all the time, why not replicate that in software? So I, I think what I'm seeing is that, is that get that yeah, right? That's, that's, that's exactly right. And, and the job consistently changes too. So it's not like this robotic process yeah. that, that you can just automate away. Yeah. Um, they're looking for certain things one day, then they're looking for certain things the next day. But you need a capability that kind of matches their expertise. You know, I was talking to a CIO the other day, um, and uh, we were talking about you know some of the things around reproducing things, replicating, and the notion of you know how things get scaled and or moved on. He's like or moved along growth is his expression was throw a body at that, yeah. you know, like and that's a, that's been IT, right? Yeah. <laughs> Outsource it. Yeah. Um, so throwing a body or throw bodies at it you know, throw that problem. I mean, that doesn't really, really end well. No, well, with software automation, you can say, you don't have to say throw a body at it, you can say, if it, it can be automated, automate it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, here's, here's what I think most people, most people miss, is that um, we are the bottleneck in the modern production process because we can't read and understand information any faster than our parents or grandparents. And there's not enough people on the planet to increase our capacity to push things through. So I mean, if, you, if we were to compare the yeah. modern knowledge economy, it's, it's yeah. interesting, to the manufacturing process, you have raw materials, manufacture it, and, and product, right? All these 
technologies that we have effectively stack information, raw yeah. materials at the front of it. Yeah, we haven't right. actually automated that process. You nailed it, and in fact, one of the things I would say that would support that is that I interviewed uh, um, Dave Renskin, who's, uh, who, Renson, who's a SR site reliable engineer at Google, and we talk about the history of how Google scaled, and, and they have this whole new program around how to operate huge data centers. Mm. He said, years and years ago at Google, they looked at the growth and said, we're going to need a thousand people per data center, at least, if not, if a per data center, so that means we need yeah. 15,000 people just yeah. to manage the servers. Because yeah. what they did was they just did the operating cycle on who provisioning servers, mm. and essentially they automated it all the way and that created a lot of the tools that yeah. became now Google Cloud. His point was is that they now have one person, site reliable yeah. engineer, who overlooks the entire right. automation piece. That's right. This is where the action is. Yes. That concept of not to scale down the people focus, scale up the machine based model. Is that kind of the trend that you guys are riding? Ab 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 absolutely, and, and I, I think that's why AI is hot right now. I mean, AI's been, been around since the yeah. late 40s, uh, early 50s, but why this time I think is mm -hmm. different is, is one, that it's starting to, to work given the computational resources and the data that mm -hmm. we have, but then also the economic need for it. Mm -hmm. Businesses are looking and saying, how I historically address these problems I can no longer address them that way. I can't hire 15,000 people to run my data center, yeah. right? I need to now um, you augment. Gotta get out front, you got to get out in front on it. Yeah, I got to augment those people with better technologies to make them do that. All right, work. so how much does the product cost? How do people engage with you guys? What's, it, what's the engagement cost? Is it a consulting, they come in, POC, they just you ship them software, it's an appliance, it's in the cloud, you mentioned yeah, on-premise. Yeah. So what's, what's, how does the product look? And how, yeah, how much does yeah, it cost? Yeah, it, it, costs, it costs a good, good chunk for, for folks, so typically north of 500K. Um, we do provide a lot of ROI or, or around that, hence the, the ability to charge such a, such a high price. Um, typically how we push people through the, through the cycle and how we actually engage with folks is um, we do what we call demonstration of value. So there's a lot of different, or typically there's about 15 use cases that any given Fortune 500 customer wants to address. We find the, the ones with the highest ROI, the ones with accessible data. And they point the at, they say, budget. that's my problem. They point yet to it, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not hard we, to we, find. We have to, we, have to, we have to walk them through it a, a little bit. Um, hopefully they've engaged with, with other vendors in the market that have been pushing AI solutions for the last few years and have had some, some problems. Uh, uh, so they're, they're coached up on that. But we engage to a demonstration of value. We typically demonstrate that ROI, and then we transition that into a, a full operational um, deployment for them. Um, if they have a private cloud, we can deploy it on a private cloud. Typically, we, we provide an appliance to, to government customers and other folks. So is that a pre-sale activity and you throw um, bodies at it and with, on your team? Does the engagement require kind of like a, and during that kind of the workshop, if you will, I'll call it a workshop, you come in and show some value. You got to throw some people yeah, in there, you right? Got, yeah, so you have SC uh, and sales and all that exactly stuff. Exactly right, exactly right. So we'll have, we'll have our, our salesperson managing the relationship uh, and SC also in, in interacting with the data, uh, working with the system, working closely with a, a contact on the customer side. And they side. typically go, this is amazing, let's get started, or they break it up, or? They, 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 they break it up. Um, okay, so it's, it's, it's an iterative process, because a lot of times people don't, don't fully grasp the, yeah. the power of these capabilities. So they'll come through and say, hey, can you just uh, help us with this small aspect of it? Mm -hmm. Then once you show them that I can manage all of your unstructured text data, I can turn it into this giant knowledge graph on top of which I can build apps, then the light kind of goes off Got and it, they, yeah. go, they go, all right, I can see this being used in HR, marketing, yeah. I mean, legal yeah. everywhere. Yeah, I mean, you open up a whole new yeah. insight engine, basically for that's, that's exactly right. So, okay, so competition, Who's, who are you competing with? I mean, we've been covering UiPath, they just had an event in New, uh, Miami. Um, this is a hot area, who's competing with you? Who do you go up against? And how are you guys winning? Why are yeah, you winning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't we don't compete with the R RPA folks. Uh, you know, there's there's interesting aspects there, and we'll I think we'll chat about that. Um, mainly, we we can there's there are incumbents like like IBM Watson that are out there. We think IBM has done you know phenomenal research over the last sixty years in the field of of, of AI. Um, but we do run into the IBMs, um, uh, the big consulting companies. A lot of the AI deployments that we see candidly are from all the big uh, consulting shops. And they're weaker, not that you, they're weaker than yours. Yeah, I would argue yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Competitive yeah. slam. There, there's, um, you know, I think I think one of the big challenges is it because they just don't have the chops, or they are just recycling old tech no, it's, into it's, a. It is. We do have new and novel algorithms. I mean, I mean, what's what's interesting is is, and this has actually been quite hard for us, is coming out saying we've taken a step beyond deep learning. 
yeah. we've taken a step beyond existing approaches. And, yeah. and, and really it's, it's fusing those two paradigms of AI together. Because what I want to do is to be able to acquire the knowledge yeah. from the data, build a giant knowledge graph yeah. and, and use that knowledge graph for, for different applications. So yeah, yeah. We're, we deploy our systems way faster than everyone else out there and uh, our system's fully explainable. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good position to be in, at least you, from a marketing standpoint, you can have a, a leadership strategy. Yeah. You don't need to differentiate it anyway, because you're different, right? Yeah. So, yeah, 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 it looks yeah, like yeah. you're in good shape. <laughs> so easy marketing playbook there, uh, just got to pound the pavement. Um, RPA, you brought that up, and I think that's certainly been an area. You mentioned you guys kind of tip dip into that. How do you, I mean, that's not an area you would fit, that you would fit well in there. So yeah. I want to get your, although you're not positioning yourself as an RPA solution, but you can solve RPA challenges or yeah, those kinds of, explain the why, why you're not an RPA, but you will play in here's it. Here's what's so, so fascinating about, about this, this market is, is a lot of people in AI will knock the RPA guys as, as, as not being sophisticated approaches. Those guys are solving real business problems, providing real value to enterprises, and they are automating processes. <laughs> Um, then you have sophisticated AI companies like, like ours that are solving really high level um, uh, white collar worker tasks. Yeah. And it's interesting, I, I feel like the AI community needs to kind of come down a step of sophistication mm -hmm. and the RPA companies are starting to come up a level of sophistication and that's where you're starting to see that overlap. Um, RPA companies moving from RPA to intelligence process automation where AI companies can actually add value in the analysis of unstructured text data. Mm -hmm. So around natural language processing, natural language understanding, RPA companies no longer need to look at specific structured uh, aspects and forms, but can actually move into more um, sophisticated extraction of things from text data and other, other Well, sources. I think it's not a mutually exclusive scenario anymore. As you mentioned earlier, there's a blending of the two machine learning mm. and symbolics coming together in this new reasoning model. If you look at RPA, my view is it's been kind of a dogmatic view of certain things. They had to replace people. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, like, totally. We got robotics. <laughs> like, we don't need people in the manufacturing line. We just put, you know, yeah. put robotics on as an example. Um, and AI has always been about get the best out of the software and the data. So if you look at it, the new RPA that we see that's relevant is, to your point, let's use machines to augment humans. Mm. A different, that's a cultural thing. Yeah. So I think, I think you're right, I think it's coming together in new ground where most people who are succeeding in data, if you will, data-driven or AI, really have the philosophy that humans have to be getting the value. Yeah. Like that yeah. SRE example, Google. So that's a fundamental thing. Absolutely. And Okay, so what's next for you guys? Uh, Business is good. Business is business is good. Hiring, I'm imagining with your kind of uh, always, community. Always, always hiring. Uh, phenomenal AI and ML expertise. If you have it, good luck us, competing with Google. Us, shoot us you know, an email. Google, Facebook, uh, hire him all the way. Well, how do you how do you handle that? I mean, yeah, I mean you know. they actually get to work on novel algorithms. I mean, what's what's fascinating is a lot of the the AI out there. I mean, you could date it all the way back to Rummel Harton Hinton's uh, paper from 1986. So I mean, we've had backprop for a while. If you want to come work on new novel algorithms yeah. that are really pushing the, the limit of what's possible. Yeah, if you're bored of Google or Facebook, check these guys check out. Check us out. Um, okay, so funding, you got plenty of money in the bank, strategic partners. Uh, what's the vision? What's your goal for the next 12 months or so? What's your objective? Yeah, focusing uh, big on the customers that we have now. Um, I'm, I'm always big on uh, having customers uh, get get a viral factor within the the uh, B2B enterprise software space. Yeah. Get customers that are screaming from the mountaintop that this is the best stuff ever. Then you can kind of take care of it. How about BizDev partnerships? Are you guys looking at an ecosystem? Obviously. Rising tide floats all boats. I mean, I can almost imagine, I salivate for some of the software you're talking about. Like we have all this data here inside the queue. We have all kinds of processes that are, we're trying to streamline. I mean, we need more software. I mean, can I buy your stuff? I mean, you want yeah, to have a million bucks. Can in, I get a discount? In, in, I, mean, I mean, how do we'll I, see, I mean, we'll see, we'll see. Like, we'll see how I mean, the is end there of like this, a uh, dev <laughs> partner program? I mean, no, I'm no, just not. kidding about the queue. We'd love to have the software, but. It's to partner, do you guys partner? That's yeah, nice. uh, so, so not yet in exposing APIs to, to third parties. So, I mean, I would love if I have the balance sheet to, to go to market horizontally, <laughs> but I don't. Okay. So it's go to market vertically, focus on specific solutions. Industries, industries so, so pharma, your industry far, government, so, so financial got, services. That's the ones you got right they're, now, they're the, for they're now. They're the three. Yeah, okay, so once right. you nail an industry, you move on to the next one. Yeah, and then I would love to expose APIs for to have partners work on this stuff. I mean, we see that, 
every day is someone wants to use certain engines that we have for to embed them within applications. Well, I mean, you've got a nice horizontal, uh, vertical strategy, you can knock down maybe one or two verticals, then you kind of lay down a foundational yeah. you know, development platform. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right, strategy. that's right. That, and and we know. can be, I mean, candidly, I think we can be embedded in, in every application uh, out there that's that's looking at unstructured well, Also data. the market maturity, you got to go where the customers are and you know the vision of having like this global platform is could be a great vision, but you got to meet the customers where they are and where they are now is solve my vertical problem. Yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and for us, yeah. with, with new technologies, well, show me that they're better than other approaches, right? Like I can't go to market horizontally and just say I have better AI than Google. Who's, yeah. gonna, who's gonna come be on the Kindle? Well, IBM's been trying to do with, with Watson yeah. and that's hard. It's very and hard they end to up do. Specializing in, in in industries. Yeah. Well, Ryan, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Uh, Kindy, great company, check them out, they're hiring. We're going to keep an eye on these guys because they're really hitting a, a part of the market that we think here at theCUBE is going to be super powerful. It's really the intersection of a lot of major markets, cloud, AI, soon be blockchain, supply chain, data center, of course, storage, networking. This is IoT security and data at the center of all the action. Uh, new model's going to emerge, and I think you guys are in the center of it, so thanks for coming and sharing your story, appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm John Furrier here in the Cube Studios in Palo Alto. Thanks for watching.